Well, I want to make this as brief as I can for about, uh, oh, I guess four years at these conventions and talking to everybody, the question always comes up, uh, where are the people that don't look like us? Where are the younger people? Why don't TV people care about uh, skepticism? And I've given one answer over and over again, and that is South Park. I believe that South Park is, uh, yes, there's bullshit. Yes, there's Mythbusters, but the, uh, the strongest force for uh, critical thinking and clarity uh, on TV and also uh, two of the funniest writers that are alive work for and created and direct and produce and do the voices for South Park. Um, it's the greatest. And uh, so I thought this year, rather than me talking about them, we would have them here to answer your questions. They're not going to do any prepared speech. We'll talk a little bit to you, and then they'll take questions from you like we all did yesterday. And uh, I just want to say that with all due respect to everyone in this room and having, uh, ha having tried it myself, the best explanation of Talking to the Dead, John Edward, cold reading, was done on South Park. Uh, and... Matt and Trey got some of that information from Randy. Uh, they are, they are, they're two men who are friends of mine, and two men, we asked the question about heroes the other day. Two men are my absolute heroes. Ladies and gentlemen, Trey Parker, Matt Stone, South Park. Hello? Hello? Okay. We disagree. We think we do kind of look like you, actually. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we were told uh, when we were asked by Penn to come out and do this uh, not very long ago, just like a, a week or two ago, um, we, uh, um, we both knew James Randi mostly from, we remembered him as a kid. We remembered seeing him on, on some shows and, and uh, when we wanted to do a show about John Edward, um, I remember we had been doing the show already for about four years, and the whole crew and everyone in the office was always just agreeing, yeah, stick it to them, yeah, stick it to them, that's cool, we'll stick it to them now this week. And, and then we were like, oh, this John Edwards guy, we got to take this fucking guy down, right? So we, um, so, and then we're like, uh, so we're going around telling the office, yeah, we're going to take, we're going to take on John Edwards. And so many people in the office were like, well, that stuff's true, you know. And we're like, well, no, come on, you know, it's, it's, it's an obvious trick, and, and they're like, and then even some people were like, yeah, John, you're right, he's, he's full of crap, and he screws it up for the people that really can do it. <laughs> and so, um, that episode actually was the first time that we, uh, and not the last time, but the first time that we did go to James Randi's site, because we knew, uh, we remembered him, and uh, we, we said, um, all right, there's got to be a trick to this. Remember that guy, James Randi? I bet, I bet he can explain this. And we got on the internet like we do every week, and, and we just read it through. And basically, what ended up in the show, which Penn says is the best explanation of how it works, was from James Randi, actually, not uh, so. <laughs> and so um, uh, Penn said that we could just sort of come up here and open it up to questions because we definitely are not speakers. We're cartoon makers, so... As you'll see, we're not very eloquent speakers, and we don't have much to say. <laughs> well, then why don't we go to questions? <laughs> you guys were big fans. Um, I was just wondering, when you watch the show, the John Edward is the douche, um, Stan seems to always be like the voice of reason. Do you guys kind of base your opinions, or do you, you kind of speak through him, or is it just... Well, in that show, Stan is the voice of reason, but we, we always, we kind of change it. I mean, sometimes Kyle is, and sometimes for a long time in the, the beginning. The Scientology one, too, you're, uh, he was like the one Yeah, that, he was, yeah, that's, yeah. that's true. I don't know, I mean, it, but it, it kind of goes back and forth because, you know, at the end of the day, we have to tell a story. And so while we're trying to make these points and we're trying to be, you know, critical of certain things, it's, at the end of the day, we got to tell a story. But in that, in that episode, definitely, like, Stan is just being... James Randi. I mean, just, just you know, and so, uh, but it, it changes, you know, from uh, episode to episode. Could you give us the backstory to the Scientology episode? Why was it pulled off the air for a while, and then how did it, how did you get it back on the air, and just tell us what was going on there. Well, everyone pull up a chair. That's a long, that's a long, that's a long story, but 
Uh, briefly, I mean, we wanted to do a Scientology episode since the show started, mostly because Scientology is just funny. And I mean, you know, it's like at the end of the day, like we like, you know, like Trey said, bringing people down, but Scientology is just hilarious. It's just funny. And you, when you got to come up with comedy, you know, there's this big fertile ground. You're just like, let's go over there and make fun of that. And, but unfortunately, Isaac Hayes was a Scientologist. So just out of politeness, really, and um, just to be nice to Isaac, for years we didn't touch it. And I just think it was a couple years ago we couldn't think of anything else one day. <laughs> <laughs> We were out of ideas, and we, I remember Trey's like, let's do a Scientology episode, and we kind of, I remember I was like, well, the lawyers won't let us do it, because Scientology is so, you know, lawyer heavy. They sue everyone who tries to do anything about them. And we called Comedy Central, and to, to Comedy Central's credit, they said, yeah, go ahead and do it. And it aired, and then, you know, everything kind of started hitting the fan for them. And, um, but it really started hitting the fan about three months later. Now Isaac had quit the show. We, that had all happened. And then we got a call on Wednesday morning that that Wednesday night's rerun of the Scientology episode was not going to air because of some producers of Mission Impossible 3 that didn't want it to air. <laughs> and that's really what happened, and it got pulled off the air. So, and we hit the roof, and I don't know, is there anything, you know? They said, because uh, they, they called us and they said, listen, guys, we need to tell you, we're going to pull this episode. Um, because certain people involved with Mission Impossible 3 want it pulled off. So we're going to pull it off, but we just don't want you to say anything to anybody. <laughs> and, uh, and we, honest to God, I mean, what was cool was we said, we don't have to because you, re you don't realize the world you live in now. This, people are going to notice. It's going to be on the Internet. And sure enough, without us saying anything, the next morning at 6 a.m., it was Tom Cruise got the show pulled off of here's how it went down and all this stuff. And they thought it came from us. And so, but we didn't. They didn't. Um, I really enjoyed the episode where I think it was Cartman um, had fell off the roof and ended up waking up in hospital and people thought he suddenly developed psychic powers. Um, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about where that one came from. I, I thought it was wonderful. Yeah, that um, one, whether that was another JREF source for your background. It, it was another, it was off of that show, that psychic detective show, you know. Um, because it gets hard, believe me, it gets, after 10 years, it gets pretty fucking hard to come up with this shit, you know? And, <laughs> and uh, so, so pretty soon you just start seeing something on TV and you go, okay, let's do that, you know? And, uh, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember much about that episode. Oh, people, people on our staff were like, yeah, but the CIA really does use psychics and they really do work. I'm like, no, they don't. Like, our whole staff, and we love, I mean, we have like a bunch of people working for us who are great and smart and like, we love, and it was like only me and Trey were like, they, no, that doesn't work, you guys. John Edward can't talk to the dead. Like, yes, he can. It was amazing. It was actually really, it was amazing to us. The, the it was really like, I, I was surprised how many people bought it, you know what I mean? Um, but again, like when you watch John Edwards or you watch The Psychic Detective, it's just funny. You know, it's just funny shit, so, you know, we have to make fun of it. Um, I have to say, ever since I started watching the show at a, age of two, I've, um, <laughs> I've never been able to see you two as the principal voices for the four boys, so I've wondered, are the voices digitally modified after recording, or are you just extremely good at voice talents? We are extremely good at voice talents. Um, however, I mean, when we, when the first time that Matt and I, we, we started this in college, and we made a little short called The Spirit of Christmas, and it was just, um, all, all that we did was, at that time, there wasn't even much digital recording equipment you could get in the home, so it was just a little four-track recorder. And we learned that we could do a voice and then just speed up the tape just a little bit, and then that made, that made the boys, you know? So uh, obviously we do a lot of the voices that aren't the boys, um, but for, for anything that's a kid, we usually uh, speed it up uh, three semitones for people that work in Pro Tools, three semitones. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, there's a major war going on, a war against Christmas. And uh, I've, heard from, uh, I've heard from a lot of people, uh, like Bill O'Reilly on this. One person or um, one entity who I have not heard from is Mr. Hankey. And uh, we were wondering what side he might be on. And does he remain the Christmas poo? Or is he a holiday poo? Or a seasonal poo? Or multicultural poo or something? Seasonal poo just doesn't work for me. It sounds like a... <laughs> It sounds like a cooking ingredient. Uh, 
No, I mean, I, that's, you know, I, I um, obviously South Park's always had a lot to do with Christmas, and it's just because, I mean, I, I grew up loving Christmas and loving Christmas icons and Christmas stories, and uh, um, I think Mr. Hankey would always be the Christmas poo, because that's what he is. He's poo, and he's about Christmas, and he's totally loves everything else, but he's all about Christmas, so I don't think I, we'll change him anytime soon. Uh, Love Orgasmo and uh, Cannibal, the musical and such. You said you wrote in in your Playboy interview that because Robert Redford, without having even seen South Park, was dissing it, you had to drown him in a river of shit along with Sundance <laughs> Festival. Do you find that now when people who may not like the show see you two coming, they kind of turn away because, or the people don't want to disagree with you because then they're going to have an episode where they're getting fisted by Cartman or something? <laughs> We have learned that, I mean, especially after Team America, so much of Hollywood distanced themselves from us. Um, not really because of what we did to celebrities, but because of sort of its point of view or lack thereof, um, and it just didn't agree with theirs, and so, um, but people, I think, definitely know not to piss us off either. Um, I mean, look at Tom Cruise. We got Tom Cruise kicked out of Paramount, which is pretty cool. Um, I really liked your intelligent design episode. I thought the message was, was spot on and like throwing in the Wii stuff and that, making it uh, uh, accessible to the, the entire culture was great. Um, I just wanted, uh, about uh, Richard Dawkins, you're pretty hard on him there. We knew this would come up here. And uh, I know, I know, but I, I'm not going to... You're just uh, waiting. It only took... Only yeah. Um, <laughs> took 10 my minutes. Qu my question is, uh, he, he's a person I respect. I don't know how you feel about him, but you treated him fairly because that's how you treat all celebrities. But do you, do you ever like, feel like you have to pull your punches on someone? Cause, or you feel, sorry, oh, I wish I don't have to do this to this guy. Um, your questions? I think Matt should answer that. <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're going to pull punches on, we're going to pull punches on Richard Dawkins after all the stuff that we've done. I mean, uh, we wanted to do a show on, on atheism because it seemed to be the, this kind of like subject du jour with all the, the new books that have come out. And it also happened that we, we um, this summer was, re it was really a, like, we, we learned something. So we were surprised to find out that there was a common con uh, perception that we were atheists, that Trey and I were avowed atheists. And we were asked in this interview if we were avowed atheists. And we said no. And, and, I, and we both kind of said no for our own reasons. This is why I'm not an atheist, this is why I'm not an atheist. <laughs> and then the next day we got this really nice uh, email from Penn, our best friend Penn. And um, it really got us thinking about it. You know, I mean, I mean, uh, as much as a lot of the show comes from our life, and this was just something that was happening to us, where for the first time we were like, oh yeah, uh, you know, am I an atheist? No, because we don't, we never attack, we make fun of religion and we, we have fun with all of its icons and all its myths and stuff, but I'm also fascinated with it, and I think Trey is too. And there's a lot of good stuff there as far as storytelling. And it's part of America. So, like, if you want to do a comedy show about America, you can't not do it about religion. Um, that being said, my personal view of Richard Dawkins is he's the smartest, dumbest person in the world. It probably won't come across real well in this room, but, like, the, that's kind of the message. You know, our message in the show was that people will fight about anything. Um, Richard Dawkins is obviously a brilliant man, but some of his book was frustrating to read because you'd read something so smart, and then to me, something so, like, what? You know, you read something that was just so like, how could you say this? Um, so we had him fall in love with Mr. Garrison, you know? <laughs> I don't know why that proves anything about Mr. Garrison, but we just like, you know, we tried to be funny. I was just really excited about the Wii coming out, and, um, and, and so uh, we ca actually, it was, it, was a great ex it was a great experience because we, it was one time that we, when we have a, a sort of topic show, we do try to research it a lot, and we get into it and, and try to really figure out what we're saying. And we don't come into a show, we try never to come into a show saying, let's say this, let's make this point. We try to always say, let's tell the story, and then come Monday or Tuesday morning when the show's done, we're like, oh, look, that's our point. You know, we, we really try to, to do that. But it was a great experience because we, we actually went back and forth a lot with Penn, and we got on the phone with Penn a lot, and we're just because we needed things clarified, you know, because a lot of people in this room and Penn know Dawkins more than just that one book, which is 
all we knew. Um, and so, again, it wasn't, what can we say about Dawkins, what can we do about Dawkins? It was the Wii's coming out, I'm super excited, Cartman should be excited too. And meanwhile, all this other stuff's happening, you know what I mean? Well, I was with Dawkins the very next morning after your show aired, and he was most upset that you didn't get his accent correct. Yeah, we heard that. Which means I guess he thought he looked just like himself. Well, my name is Margaret Downey. I'm the newly elected president of the Atheist Alliance International. And I wanted to tell you that the 15-year-long feud between American Atheist and Atheist Alliance International is officially over. Yeah, but the otters are coming I now. I was just going to tell you that we're still battling the otters. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yesterday, Penn told us that you're in a position to do pretty much whatever the hell you want at Comedy Central. So I have to ask if the decision not to show Muhammad in that episode, which you would have done for the second time, was yours or was No, it we absolutely couldn't. And uh, it, it's a pretty interesting story because um, we had actually shown Muhammad like five years ago. We did an episode called The Super Best Friends and it had all the religious leaders working together, you know, and, and Muhammad, I believe, had the, the gift of fire and could like burn things with his hands and stuff like that. So. But, you know, and, and, and so the show came and went. And I remember people telling us when it was happening, they said, you know, you can't show an image of Muhammad. And I was like, I can't? And they said, no, it's, it's against the, you know, it's, it's against the Muslim faith. And I was like, no, I'm not Muslim. I can show Muhammad. Fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> and, uh, and so, it, it, you know, we heard that a few times, and then nothing happened. And then I was actually on my honeymoon in, in Disney World a year ago and turned on the TV and there's all these people, Muslims rioting, rioting, and down at the bottom it says, cartoon sparks protests. And I was like, holy shit, it took that long. And I, and I got my wife and I was like, we gotta get out of Disney World right now. And, uh, and, uh, and then finally, you know, it kept going and it said it was this, and I was like, it was that. And um, so, so then, of course, you know, we were only two months away from airing new episodes. We got together for the writer's retreat to see what we're going to talk about. I was like, well, Cartoon Wars. It was called Cartoon Wars. How can we not do that? And we said to Comedy Central, oh, great news. You know, we're, we got a great idea for the first episode. We're going to show Muhammad and talk about, you know, why you can't show him. And, all. and they're like, no, 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 no. And we said, no, we're going to. And they said, no. And uh, we came up, well, what if we do it this way? No. What if we do it that way? No. And, uh, but finally, we kind of, we bent because... They were on it. They didn't hide behind, the, the network didn't hide behind anything of like, you know, we, we have to respect their beliefs and all that. They said, we're scared of being bombed. <laughs> and it was like, okay, at least you're being honest. You're scared of being bombed and you, and you don't want to take the responsibility. But on the other hand, we have to talk about this. And, and we've learned through, you know, nine years of doing the show that there's lots of ways to approach things and do it where your audience can still totally think about it and talk about it without ha having to hit it over the head. Um, and so we did do the show with Muhammad and of course we made it on Family Guy so that they would get in trouble, not us, if uh, people saw it. But, because um, that was our first idea, was like, let's just do it all like Family Guy. And then, because they said, we're scared of getting bombed. We said, what if we do the whole show like Family Guy so that then when the Muslims see it, they'll be like, ooh, it's Family Guy and they'll bomb that. You know, and they were like, that's not cool, that's really not cool. That's all, we're not really that brave, that was the point. <laughs> So by the time it gets over there, it'll look like Family Guy, and then we can hide. As a uh, former Mormon, or as I call myself, a foreman, um, <laughs> I've always wondered about your fascination with Mormonism. Can you explain that? Well, we, we, we grew up in Colorado, so there was, there was a lot of Mormons around. Like, you know, a couple of my really good friends in elementary school were Mormons, and, and so there was a lot of the influence there. Um, I, I just... I'm totally fascinated with Mormonism, and, I, and I, I don't know why. It's like, it's a good storytelling thing in like Orgasmo or, um, I mean, other things, because it, it's like shorthand for naive and like super religious white people, right? You know, just like, hey, what's going on? Like, that's, you know, that's like, you know, you just say Mormon. It's like Nazis, are, you know, shorthand for bad guy. Mormons are trying for like naive. And, and um, so they're great story, you know, for storytelling with that, but it's just, when you read, um, the beginnings of Mormonism, you read the Joseph Smith story, you're just like, wow, wow, really? I just, the idea that like, and it's in cults and it's in religion and stuff, but the idea of anybody that can get like Joseph Smith, like people that give him money and let him have sex with their wives, 
I know respect is the wrong word, but there's something like incredible about that. <laughs> you know, that's like, I want to know more about those guys. Like, it's just like fascinating. That's all. Right? Um, I think that what you've been able to accomplish is nothing short of amazing. And I just wanted to take this unique opportunity to say thank you. Well, well thank you. Uh, is there a chance of seeing uh, maybe another version of That's My Bush, perhaps after the next election, maybe? I love that show. Fantastic show. The only story we have about that is that um, we got together, we wanted to do a sitcom about the president, and at the time, we were sure it was going to be Al Gore. Um, and uh, it was going to be called Absolutely. Absolutely Our Life's a Gore, right? Something like that. And so. We got, we got together with the writers on, on the night of the election and we're just like, okay, as soon as this election's over, we can be sure we can start going. And then that, of course, was the election where it got recounted and recounted, recounted. And so we had to actually push production back and back and back because it wasn't sure who it was going to be. And then the thing, and so a lot of people thought we were, you know, we had set out to make a big anti-Bush show. And in fact, it wasn't, it wasn't set out to be an anti-Gore show either. It was just we wanted to make a sitcom about the real president. And so... Uh, would we do it again? I don't think so, just because cartoons are a lot more fun. Yes, was there any reaction from Salt Lake about the uh, Mormon episode and how can I get that great dum 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 song out of my head? I'll tell you what, you know, we, we go different places we go in the country, it's really fascinating because we'll go some places and they'll be like, South Park guys, wow, you know. We'll go to other places and they'll be like, it's the basketball guys. And we're just like, oh, God, no. <laughs> and, uh, but, when, I, I really, I've said this to a lot of people, I don't, I, there's like, I get a whole different vibe when I'm in Salt Lake City, and it's not what you would think. I'm like, treated way more like a hero there than anywhere else. And of course, it's not by the older crowd, uh, but, but um, so many of the, the, you know, younger kids, or at least kids at the time, you know, were, were just like, are such huge orgasmo fans. <laughs> you know, that it was like, <laughs> It was pretty cool, and, um, and so we, we go to Salt Lake City all the time. In fact, we're, we're working right now on a Broadway musical about Mormons, and, uh, and so we've been to Salt Lake a few times, because I love going to Temple Square and just walking around and laughing. It's just great. <laughs> that was a tough, doing that episode was, because in the episode, it basically tells the Joseph Smith story, the beginnings of Mormonism, and it was really tough. And we run into this sometimes, making fun of John Edwards, or Scientology is a perfect example or more is where you're trying to tell like, okay, we want to tell him that you're Joseph Smith and he went and dug up the plates and then a salamander talked to him and it's like, well, people are going to think we just made that up. <laughs> and so you have this whole problem where, you, you know, where Scientology, when we did the Scientology creation myth, it's like, it's so stupid that it looks like we must have made that up. So we had to put this thing at the bottom that said, you know, this is actually what they believe. And I remember that was a big problem with the Mormon episode too, was making it funny, but making sure people understood that this is, this is real. You know, this is really what they think, and maybe the dum 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 song kind of helped that make sense. I, um, how much longer can we expect to see South Park on the air, and when is DVDA going to go on tour, man? You guys got to come to Chicago. Uh, yeah, touring our band. Which, when should we do that? <laughs> <laughs> DVDA, we, we played like um, three live shows about 12 years ago, and we've been on a hiatus ever since. <laughs> so maybe we've got a comeback tour that we should put together. And as far as South Park, I mean, it's still fun, and, and it's, well, it's not fun all the time, but it's, the, we go through these kind of, once, you know, we do two runs a year, and once every run, we definitely think this is it, we can't come up with anything. And then we have, you know, it seems like by the next time we have to go out and do more shows, I don't know, we've come up with more ideas. So as soon as, I don't know, I think that day, will, I think it will present itself, but I don't know, for a few more years at least. It's, as long as people are stupid, we'll probably be able to have a show. So, so that's at least another three or four years, I think. Um, you mentioned you'd gotten some resistance on your John Edward and um, Psychic Detective shows. And I was wondering if you, by the time those shows finished production, had you converted any of your crew? Uh, what, what's interesting was that a lot of people were like, you know what, that guy is a douche. <laughs> but my aunt knows this guy that can really do it. <laughs> you know, so it's, ju it's just, it's that thing of, you know, you're never gonna, you're never gonna convert anybody with, with one show and with one, uh, probably with one book and probably with one anything, but, uh, you know, you just keep plugging away. <laughs> it was, uh, this year it happened when we did a 9-11 conspiracy show 
and we and Trey, we went in the editing room with our editors and editors and some people working the show. And why can't we do this 9/11 conspiracy show? Make fun of those people. Well, you know, the burning, you know, the the burning temperature of propane isn't blowing. And these people start talking like, oh no, like half our office, you know, was like 9/11 conspiracy. We're like, oh boy. But see, the thing is, is we're the boss, <laughs> so they have to work on the show even if they disagree with it. <laughs> But I don't know if we can burn anybody in our office, but they have to do it. I live just up the street from my distinguished colleague, Mr. Bidlock, here in Colorado Springs. And when our family goes skiing, we'll drive up through uh, Route 9, up through Alma and Fair Play and various things like that. Um, I'm just curious, did you all, when you were at UC, did you spend a lot of time in South Park? Why South Park County and Alma and Fla Fair Play and so on, as opposed to Elbert or El Paso or some, there's all sorts of interesting material. Well, because those places are weird. Right, right. Uh, of course, yeah. Thanks, thanks very yeah, much. I, I grew up in a town, little town called Conifer, which was on 285 up towards South Park. And so um, South Park was this big, empty valley. And it's sort of, if you look at it on a map, it's actually, um, it's almost a, a perfectly circular valley right in the middle of the Rocky Mountains. So just that alone was just kind of weird. And, and what happened when I was growing up, it was the place where any weird story you would hear, you know, there, there was UFOs last week, you know, in South Park. They, and all the cattle mutilations, all that stuff, it was always from South Park, you know, and so that was always just the weird thing you heard mythological stories from, so. I have a good friend who's a Raelian, and so I read their, their main book and discovered they believe that Jesus and the other prophets were alien-human hybrids and that Jesus walked on water with anti-gravity guns, and that's all in their main book. I was wondering, any, any chance of doing a show on the Raelians? I'd, I'd like to see the visual of Jesus walking on water. I don't think water. you can make fun of that because it's true. I mean, that just, that sounds more reasonable to me than most things I've heard. Hi, uh, I have a quick question, and then just a, a quick personal aside. Um, when you introduce a new character like uh, Scott Tatterman or something, where do you come up with uh, the name for him? Do you, do you just make it up, or is it somebody you know? And then just uh, to let you know, I'm Steve Packard, um, P-A-C-K-A-R-D, like the antique car, or like Hewlett Packard. Actually, Steven, spelled with a PH. I'm actually a junior. My middle initial is M. People call me Dr. Buzzo. That's my name on the form. Just under 6'2". Uh, sideburns, keep my hair short. Real nasal voice. All right, bye. Be careful what you wish for, because... <laughs> you know, usually names are, are pretty much random, but uh, watch who you're getting butt-fucked by next week on the show. <laughs> My name is Phil Blake. I, I have two questions. Um, first of all, when you started South Park, did you have any idea it was going to become just the huge thing that it is, is today? I mean, did you have any idea that all of this was going to happen? We wanted to do a skeptics conference in 12 years. <laughs> I said, you know what, the quickest, easiest way to do that. No, I mean, <laughs> uh, do you have more? Did you want oh, well, one more question, follow up on his. Do you really model your characters after anyone, or do you just make them up? Um, well, well, both, but a lot, of, a lot of characters are like, sometimes it's like the drawing's based on somebody, or the voice is based on like, like somebody, you know, like uh, Mr. Garrison is based on uh, a professor that Trey had in college that he would make fun of, and that's the voice, the, the professor, and like Butters is me making fun of our animation director. And so, and that's kind of, you know, I mean, that's how a lot of people come up with characters is you start imitating and making fun of somebody and you get, you know, you, cap, you, know, you get their kind of essence or whatever and that becomes a character. But to your first question, I mean, when South Park started, we got an order for, I mean, first of all, like, to just have Comedy Central buy our script for our show was this amazing thing. You know, we're just two guys from Colorado and then, and then they ordered a pilot and it took us a year to make the pilot. And just making a pilot, I mean, all, all, every step seemed like such a huge success, you know, for us. And, and I remember when, you know, when we got a six episode order, that was the first order. It's like, you're gonna have six episodes of television on the air. I mean, that's, that's it. Like for, when you come from independent film, that's, you, that's the dream. It doesn't go any further than that. So we never thought more than past like the next run or the next year and now all of a sudden it is 10 years later and we're just as surprised as anyone. How do you respond to the family values groups and the parents groups who complain that your show sets a bad example for kids because you have eight-year-olds cursing and, and, and stuff like that? We completely agree with them. And, uh, you know, the, I, think, I think Penn touched on this yesterday, too. I mean, it, it really is, 
we get asked the question a lot, you know, and uh, you know, how how did how did you fight to get all this stuff on? And it really, we'd love to say that, you know, well, we did this, we stood our ground, and we said no, you know. But the the, the truth is, we put fart jokes on TV, and people started throwing money at us, you know, and we just, <laughs> and then we're like, well, how about this? And they threw more money at us, you know, and and uh, for the most part. Uh, you know, I, I mean, the, the biggest backlash we've ever experienced in our careers was after Team America from the liberals. And I, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, that was the first time that we really had a large group of people saying, how dare you? And um, for the most part, you know, everything we heard from the religious groups were like, this is wrong, this is wrong, which is, they're totally entitled to think so and whatever, but Sean Penn was the first guy to write a letter and say, you better stop this, to us personally. And it was just like, Dude, you know. <laughs> if, I mean, personally, if I, if I, I would, if we could, and we haven't, but I would like to secretly pay family groups to get mad at us. It just gives us good press. It's just the best. You know, I mean, sometimes, I mean, and the big, it was really helpful for us, but the big kind of lie, the biggest lie about the beginnings of South Park was that that, that, that even happened. No one was mad. I mean, you know, in the beginning it was like, we're on the, the South Park's on the cover of Newsweek. The kids shouldn't be watching this, and they'd go find that one guy. There's this, well, I can't remember his name, and I don't even want to say it because I don't even want to give him the, you know, you know, satisfaction. I can't remember, but it's some one guy they always call to get these quotes for. But the truth was, there was no groups getting mad. It just, it seemed like there should be, you know? And so, like, the press just kept saying it, and we're like, yeah, people are getting mad, yeah. And it helped us out, but it never really happened. <laughs> last season, it was this, not last season, because a lot, of, but the season before last, we were like, every episode, we're like, God, people didn't get pissed at that. <laughs> it was that Catholic League? We did this, the Bloody Mary show. When finally, so the so the so the Catholic League of whatever that is, it's just some little, it's just some guy and his twelve cousins who joined a you know, thing. It really is actually, and and um, they pressured a Catholic board member of of uh, Paramount to have this episode rescheduled right around Christmas time last year. And when we got that call, it really was just a rescheduling. And we were like, you know, it, it made us mad, but on the other hand, it was like, you know, it was the Virgin Mary shitting blood on the Pope's face. <laughs> so, you know, like, you gotta choose your battles. And so for us, it's like, well, all right, you know, it's like for us, it's like, we kind of were like sitting there going, that really is pretty bad. I don't know, I can see how people are mad about that. So, we don't get too caught up on the little things anymore. We, <laughs> we feel like the big war we've, we've won, so. <laughs> this will be our last question, I'm sorry. Hi, I was wondering if there were any characters or episodes you kind of regret doing for creative reasons or, um, I guess, political, though I doubt that. I regret all of season two and half of season three. Um, <laughs> just because, I mean, it's hard, it's really hard. I mean, we've stuck with the show and, and a lot of TV shows you know, people sort of set them up, and everyone told us, you know, what, well, you're set up now. Now you go away and you have other writers come in and do it, and you collect your money. And we just wanted to stay and do the show, and it's nice that we were able to see it evolve. But the other side of that is now we get to look back and see what we thought was funny 10 years ago. And for mo I think for most people in this room, that would be painful, you know, to see, I thought that was funny 10 years ago, you know. So um, it, it, it's always hard to look back. But um, yeah, I don't, well, we've never regretted anything we've said politically or done politically just because well oh yeah we kind of i mean the only time we we kind of after an episode aired and we were like i don't know we had this episode where the big joke at the end was aids aids is finally funny and it was this whole joke about i mean it was a whole statement on you know comedy is tragedy plus time which is just right i mean everyone knows that concept of like it's not funny and then like 5 years later you're all laughing about it but we didn't really mean AIDS is funny. We meant it's okay. It's finally time to make. We can finally make jokes about AIDS. But you know, I mean, the, it seems like you're splitting hairs. But we, you know, it's it's a real fine line. You want to be understood. And when you're dealing with a lot of the subject matter, sometimes you're like, oh, I think we could have said that a little better. You know, like is this more, more precisely what you wanted to say? But at the end of the day, like, yeah, we don't, I don't think we regret any anything. Hope not. So, that's all. Are we done. Let's go on. Thank you. Thank you. You got an award, too.
Well, on behalf of the James Randi Educational Foundation, Mr. Randi, and it's a pretty big thrill for me, I want to thank the guys from South Park, Trey and Matt. Thank you so much.